Hey there guys, so with 2021 finally over, it was time to do my top 10 films of that year. Now 2021 has been the comeback year of films, and I hope to continue that on with 2022 despite this Omnicron variant. Now before I get started with my number 10, I want to say some honourable mentions. Now my first honourable mention is The Suicide Squad. As a fan of this property since 2011, reading the comic books, James Gunn came along and added his own wit and humour and made the Suicide Squad I've been asking for years. My second honourable mention is Slam. This should be in its own category. It's neither a horror or a fantasy and that's what I love about it. I mean, it's a timeless story that utilises magical elements to deliver a moral message. My third honourable mention is Nowhere Special. This is a simple story but yet you feel every moment of this film and you imagine yourself in this predicament. My last honourable mention is Licorice Pizza, a coming of age story about two people with different stages of their lives and the film doesn't make it awkward at all and Paul Thomas Anderson's direction is just simply amazing. The story, the performances, how he brings LA 1970s to life. As a young adult, I can relate to this film. So coming in at number 10 is West Side Story. This is a film I was skeptical about. This could have easily been a copy and paste from the original, but with a bigger budget. But Steven Spielberg gave new life to this film. It's beautifully shot and edited. Ansel Elgo and Rachel Sager are just great. I didn't like the fact they shifted scenes around from the original, but it kept the film fresh. The America song scene is just perfection. This is a film that hasn't left my mind because most of the film like, is very charismatic, but some of the film is really dark and very unsettling to watch. At number nine is a film I wasn't expecting much, but I was compelled by the beauty of it, and that's Petite Manan. Now, a weird way to describe this film, it's a time travel film without the time travel stuff. This knocks down the barriers between children and parents and builds bridges. And it's also a really cool what if story. It's only an hour and 12 minutes long, but it's such a heartbreakingly hopeful fairy tale for all ages. And number eight was one of my most anticipated films, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I can nitpick this film. It takes stuff from the first movie. Hell, it ignores the second movie. But the beauty about Afterlife that it wasn't trying to be a Ghostbusters 3. At its core, it's a story about this family, and they found a way to honor Harold Ramis and continue on with his character. McKenna Grace is just amazing in this film. The film has a lot of heart, and it's so wonderful to watch, and the last 10 minutes always hits me on so many levels. At number seven is my favorite documentary of the year, The Reason I Jump, which is based on the novel that deals with autism. Now, we forget that films can be educational. Not only when I came out of the theater, I had a better understanding of autism and the many forms of it, but also the way the film renders it is very humanistic, and you could just see the love and the craft in every frame. At number six is King Richard. Now, I thought it was gonna be one of those biopics that have great performances, but an okay story, but I was wrong. This is Will Smith's best performance since Pursuit of Happiness, and he will get an Oscar nomination. Now, I thought it was gonna be one of those films that just deals with racism, but it's so much more. It's a wonderful story about sport and family. The story about how Richard Williams and his daughters, Venus and Serena, what they had to overcome and become the superstars they are today. At number five is Our Ladies. I just love those films about coming of age, friends hanging out because I can relate it in some way or another. The film is about these five girls exploring adulthood, their sexuality and what's beyond them. It's such a well-rounded film. This film makes me laugh, it made me cry, it made me care for each of these lasses and their struggles. At number four is Shang-Chi Legend of the Ten Rings. Now from a property that is so unknown for most people, including me, this turned out to be one of the best comic book films in the last 10 years. It captures the wonders of comic book idealism. It goes towards more the fantasy genre than most MCU films. It's part of Shakespearean family tragedy, but also a martial arts masterpiece. At number three is the animated film Mitchell vs. the Machines. This was so under my radar. I was looking forward to films like Raya and the Last Dragon and Luca, which turned out good, but Mitchell vs. the Machines it's just fucking hilarious. It's so unique and creative, and it has a massive heart. It's one of those rare animated films that have a distinct animation style, but also witty humor and genius dialogue, and it also has a valuable message about 
technology and our addiction to it. So my second favourite film of the year is the musical In the Heights. This flopped at the box office, but this might be my favourite musical of all time. When I came out of theatre, I listened to the soundtrack on Spotify and I still listen to it to this day. And I know every word to every song, whether it's In the Heights or When You're Home or 96,000. I love the story of America told through the residents of Washington Heights. I love the power and the passion of the songs. I love the characters and their personal stories and their dynamics. This was such a wonderful, magical, powerful movie experience last year. So my favourite film of 2021, and surprisingly this was my most anticipated film of that year, and that's Spider-Man No Way Home, and I know what you're thinking, that's such an obvious choice. Spider-Man is my favourite superhero of all time. I grew up with the character since the 90s, whether it's the comics, the video games, the cartoons, the movies, and I'm not saying No Way Home could have failed, but it could have easily been nostalgia porn with cheap cameos that people would be too blinded to see the real flaws of the film. I love the mythology of this movie and the way they bring back familiar faces and not in a cheap way. And not only does it enhance the story of Spider-Man, but it enhances the story of Tom Holland's Spider-Man. By the end of the film, I said to myself, Tom Holland is Spider-Man now. He's not Iron Man Jr or Spider-Boy. This film took 20 years of films, including the not so good film, and made the end game of Spider-Man movies. And it's extremely fun, but surprisingly dark and emotional, and gave us the best team up of Spideys we'll ever have. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. Go like, share, and subscribe. Let me know what are your top 10 films of 2021. Go check out my Facebook, my Twitter, and my Instagram page. You guys are awesome. I got your back.